Hi, gang. It's Adam. And Patrick. Coming up on today's episode, we feel all the feels and share our Fab Five inspirational Disney songs. As always, we cover the latest Disney news and close out the show with some quick D. All that and more on today's episode of Gays Do the D. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Patrick, ding, dong, dolly, Kazaki. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot to take in. I'm going to process that and throw it back at you, Adam Nana Hummel. <laughs> <laughs> I went on a journey and you said, I'm just going to take one step. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Well, we were just talking about Peter Pan prior to <laughs> hitting record, and that was the first thing that came to my mind is Nana the dog. You've got that fabulous Peter Pan mug. I do the Minnie Mouse collection Peter Pan mug, and boy, it's Peter Pansy instead. I'm telling you what. <laughs> that silhouette of Peter Pan <laughs> is fierce. <laughs> he's serving Mary Martin. He's serving Mary Lou Retton. What other Marys have played Peter Pan? Did Mary Lou Retton ever play Peter Pan? It seems like she would have. Mary Louise Parker, Mary Stuart Masterson. <laughs> Just all the Marys. <laughs> Notable Peter Pan, Mary Louise Parker. <laughs> it was right after she did Angels in America. <laughs> can you imagine the kind of like dour Peter Pan? She'd be like, you can fly. <laughs> I guess you can fly if you really put your mind to it, but that's on you, is what she would say. <laughs> Give it a shot, but I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> I'm here for that. Silas, where's my weed? <laughs> Just one. <laughs> And my Starbucks. <laughs> Where's my Starbucks and my one weed? <laughs> <laughs> oh, where are we? What's happening right now? <laughs> How are you doing, Patrick? I am really full, Adam. I can't walk anymore. I ate more than I could lift yesterday. And why is that? Well, <laughs> as you know, the state fair is closed down this year due to a little queen we call Roni. And this year, instead, they're doing a drive through state fair food testing or tasting, I guess. Which, to many state fair goers, might be more ideal because no walking. I know. We were thinking about that last night in the car. We were like, I bet a lot of people are like, this is how we should always do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be bothered to walk from food station to food station. For those that don't know, Minnesota has one of the most famous state fairs of all the states in these United States, rivaled only probably by Texas, right? Probably. But you know what? To quote the great musical State Fair, our State Fair is a great State Fair. Don't miss it. Don't even be late. <laughs> that is, uh, you've really outgayed yourself, Adam. You, <laughs> you finished the quote from State Fair. The Tweedles need to know, Patrick, what did you put in your mouth hole? Oh, so many things. And then I had some dinner, which was <laughs> <laughs> my dinner consisted of mini donuts a pronto pup, which, in my opinion, is far superior to the corn dog. Incorrect. Uh, well, well, we'll see. Tweedledees, reach out to us. And uh, cheese curds, of course. And then Sweet Martha's cookies. And that was, that was my appetizer. I don't want to get gross on the podcast, but <laughs> how was your bowel movement this morning? Was it regular? Well, we've moved since last night. <laughs> we have a whole new house now. <laughs> I mean, I can't recommend eating that much greasy food within one hour, but I did it. It happened. I'm sorry I took us there, but I needed to know. Listen, only the hard facts here at Gaze Do The D. The truly hard, hard facts, yes. <laughs> There's nothing hard about those facts, but Adam, how was your evening? <laughs> Far less eventful, I have to say. I spent the evening finishing season two, or series two, as they say in the UK, I believe, of Glow Up. Do you watch Glow Up? No, I've heard many great things. Many people have recommended it to me, but I have not even tried to watch it yet. <laughs> Give it a shot when you have time. It's truly wonderful. It's very entertaining and inspiring and very, very funny at the same time. Is it a scripted TV series or is it a reality show? It's a reality show. Oh, okay. See, I absolutely know nothing about it other than people say, Patrick, this is up your alley. It is right up your alley. Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so that was my night. Just watching Glow Up, uh, early bedtime, did my calisthenics, said my prayers, and went to sleep. Sensible. Such a sensible evening. I'm glad for it. Do you know what else is sensible, Patrick? 
please tell me. Our Tweedledee, Jason, who you can find on Instagram at Tiki Tardis. Jason reached out to us last week. It was so sweet of him to say that he was celebrating his one year anniversary of discovering Gays Do the D. Ah, he joined us on our journey. He did indeed. And isn't it nice that he took the time to reach out? My question is, where is our anniversary present? I think the fact that he's still listening to us is a bigger gift than any of us could expect. That is gift enough. (laughs) Exactly. It's all we can literally ask for. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for reaching out. And here's to another year of mediocre podcasting for you. At best. (laughs) (laughs) Well, speaking of celebrating anniversaries, Adam, we should move on to this week in Disney history. I feel like that needs a little, like, ta-da sound effect. Adam, get on that. I'm on it. (laughs) This week in Disney history, ta-da. I guess it's just me. I'll be the sound effect. (laughs) Or what if it's the sound effect of chalk hitting a chalkboard at just the wrong angle, so it's that very irritating squeak. Like, you're teaching a lesson is where I'm going with that. I like that. I like that. With one of those chalk extenders. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, do I? (laughs) I know my way around a chalk extender. I'll tell you what. All right. So this week (laughs) in Disney history, Adam, I've got three lovely stories to tell you. I won't give away the year of the first one out of respect for this person, but we are celebrating the birthday on August 24th of one queen and legend ava duvernay oh ava's birthday ava's birthday just a little history lesson for those of you who don't know who ava duvernay is you should be ashamed of yourself first of all but she is the first black woman to win the award for directing at the sundance film festival for her film middle of nowhere she was also the first black woman to be nominated for the golden globe for best director for her film selma which is absolutely incredible she was also the first black woman to have her film nominated for the academy award for best picture the same movie selma and in 2017 her film 13th was nominated for an academy award for best documentary feature again if you haven't seen that stop what you're doing now and watch it and return to us we will wait and of course for disney she directed a wrinkle in time which had a budget of just under 250 million dollars which made ms duvernay the very first black woman to direct a live action film of that size She's a groundbreaker. That's what we'll call her, Patrick, a groundbreaker. I mean, she is absolutely brilliant. Follow her on Instagram. Watch her TED Talk on YouTube if you can. She's incredible. Absolutely incredible and inspiring. So happy birthday, Ava DuVernay. Happy 24th birthday, Ava. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Well done. Well done, you. Moving on, 56 years ago, Adam, on August 27th, 1964, a little movie called Mary Poppins had its world premiere at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, California. Never heard of it. Never, ever heard of it. And of course, the following year, one Julie Andrews would go on to win the Academy Award for Best Actress. And the movie itself would go on to win Academy Awards for Best Film Editing, Best Original Score, Best Song for Chim Chim Cheree, and Best Visual Effects. And it was nominated for Best Picture, but it lost out to My Fair Lady. Ironically so, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because Julie Andrews had originated the role of... Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady on Broadway, but she was not considered for the film or just did not get the role in the film. And instead, Audrey Hepburn did. So, yeah, kind of a kind of a slap to the face. Audrey Hepburn, who's incredible, but was not a singer, whereas they could have had Julie Andrews singing and acting. Their loss. (laughs) It's true, although they did win Best Picture, so there we are. But (laughs) happy anniversary to the classic Mary Poppins. Happy anniversary, Mary Pop. (laughs) M-Pop. That's where Rob Marshall is taking it in the third installment. She is known as M-Pop, yes. I'm here for that. I am absolutely on board with that. All right, so let's move on to our last story, our Disney history story. 106 years ago, Adam, on August 24th, 1914, we continue our education <laughs> of Winnie the Pooh, our, our education, Adam. You had a education this morning, didn't you? 
we must move on from that. So 106 years ago, Lieutenant Harry Colburn would stop at White River, Ontario and purchase a female Canadian bear cub for $20. So apparently it was very common for Canadian soldiers to have pets and mascots in their troops. And he names the bear cub Winnie after his hometown of Winnipeg. Two months later, Lieutenant Colburn and his regiment, along with the bear, are sent to London. And Winnie, the bear, is ultimately kept in the care of the London Zoo, where years later, A.A. A. Milne and his son, Christopher Robin, would meet Winnie, fall in love with him, and ultimately rename Christopher's favorite teddy bear after him. Wow. Isn't that a crazy story? It's a crazy story and i have a question because winnie the pooh is so old are we just now every this week in disney history going to have some kind of milestone in winnie the pooh history (laughs) i hope so i'm here for that too (laughs) it's now winnie the pooh corner that's so sweet it's great to know that winnie the pooh is of many countries he's not just english he originated in canada and actually, right now, I'm just realizing that I've been using the wrong pronoun because Winnie the Pooh, the the original Winnie, was a female, and I've been saying him this entire time. The storybook character is a male, but he was named after a female. Once again, a male just swooping in and assigning his own gender to a different gender. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I see where you're going, but you're making a mess of it, Adam. <laughs> I'm, I'm very riled up, Patrick. I'm very riled up. You're distraught about it. You're distraught. <laughs> so that was this week in Disney history. Well, thank you so much. It continues to be a joy to learn all of these fantastic little facts about things related to Disney. Disney and its relations. Moving on, Patrick, we have to take a moment to pause And reach into the D-bag because we received some magic mail this week. What? We did indeed. From a Tweedledee named JJ, who you can find on Instagram at jsquare3. Patrick and I had the pleasure of meeting JJ and his beautiful family at Gay Days at Disneyland last year. We sure did. They saved us, in fact. They let us watch the fireworks with them. They saved us a spot on the grounds. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. And thank you for this. I haven't opened it yet. So that may have been a premature thank you because it could be just covered in COVID. We don't know. (laughs) What's in the box, Adam? What's in the box? All right. I'm going to open this package. Ooh, that Foley work. I'm making a real mess of this. Is it just a ball of bubble wrap? Because I would love that. Disney bubble wrap. Okay. Card first. Adam and PK. Oh, he used PK. I guess we're best friends now. That's very informal of you, JJ. How very dare you? It's Madame PK to the rest of you. (laughs) Madame PK. (laughs) It is an adorable card with a toucan on it. And on the toucan's beak, it says, congrats. Oh, beautiful. And JJ writes, Adam and Patrick, congratulations on 100 episodes. You don't look a bit over 90. I hope you enjoy this bit of Disney magic from Disneyland. I hope we are all able to get back to the parks soon once things have calmed down. Congrats on 100. And here's to 100 more, JJ. Ooh, ambitious. I like it. And inside the package we have, oh, Patrick, it's a mystery item which you love. Oh my goodness. I do love a mystery item. It's my very favorite thing. In fact, it's two mystery items, and they're from the Kingdom of Cute collection. I love those pins. Oh, there's some really great options on the back. They're all attractions based. So it could be a teacup. It could be Space Mountain. It could be a Jungle Cruise boat. It could be Dole Whip. It could be a Haunted Mansion gargoyle candle holder. It could be the Sword in the Stone. It could be a people mover car, or it could be Dumbo the Flying Elephant. Okay, box one, Patrick. Here we go. Oh my gosh, so many options. What are you hoping for? What's what's your number one hope? I would really love that Haunted Mansion gargoyle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about you? I'm thinking either the teacup or the sword in the stone. It's in a dark pouch, so I can't even see through the pouch. (laughs) That's how you know they're good pins, because they are for the mystery collectors. Pin number one, So adorable. The people mover car. Oh, that's so cute. This little face on it. I love that. So, so cute. Oh, wait, there's two in each. Yeah, I was going to say, usually they come with multiples. Otherwise, I was going to say those are expensive one pin boxes. All right, so people mover was first. What is in box one, pouch two? 
I'm so excited. I could just spit. Dream fulfilled. It is the gargoyle candle holder from the Haunted Mansion. Oh, he's adorable, too. These are truly kingdom of cute. Box two, pouch one. You know, we started recording at noon, and it is now 3.30 the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little fun fact for all you Tweedledees out there. Don't give Adam a gift because it takes him eight years to open them. <laughs> <laughs> Duplicates, which is easy to split. We got another Haunted Mansion gargoyle candle holder. Oh, good. I love that one. It's so lovely. And last but not least. What are the odds that it's another people mover? Well, I've opened it, so not good. <laughs> not good. <laughs> the odds are not ever in my favor. It is, in fact, the adorable Sword in the Stone. Oh, precious. That's a really good one. It is. So we're going to have to fight over that people mover and the Sword in the Stone when I can see you again in two years. <laughs> well, thank you, JJ. That was so thoughtful of you. Yes, JJ, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. That was a very thoughtful gift. You're clearly the only Tweedledee who cares because you're the only one who sent us a gift. The rest of you, shame on your families. <laughs> Patrick, isn't it just gift enough to know that they're listening? Not for me. I need things. I need merch, Adam. I need merch. That tracks. Yeah, that fits. <laughs> well, speaking of merch, Adam, here's an idea for what people can get for us. They can go over to gazewithed.com and click on our merch tab and buy some shirts, mugs, totes, masks, what have you. What have you? And the great news is that all of the proceeds do not benefit us, do they, Patrick? They sure don't. We have made the decision to pick a different organization quarterly to donate all of our merch proceeds to. And this quarter, we are giving our proceeds to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So for those who aren't aware, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's mission is to cure cystic fibrosis and to provide all people with CF the opportunity to lead long, fulfilling lives by funding research and drug development, partnering with the CF community, and advancing high quality specialized care. And this year, Adam, I am very tied to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Some people may not know, but my niece Bailey does have cystic fibrosis. And this year, I'm involved directly with the foundation through my involvement with the Twin Cities Finest Campaign, which is to raise awareness and funds that go to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. So with donations to the CF Foundation, in our lifetime, we can ensure that CF stands for Cure Found. So from now through the end of October, all of the proceeds, as we said, from our GDTD merch shop will be donated directly to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And to make your purchase, you can head on over to gazedothed.com, click that merch tab at the top of the page, and there you will find more info around this cause, including a link to the foundation's website and, of course, to our GDTD online store where you can shop till you drop for a great cause. Not everybody can get to the parks right now, so stock up now and be ready for when you're ready to hit the parks again. Absolutely. Get that The Library is Open shirt. That's one of my favorite ones right now. And while you're heading to gazedothed.com and while you're shopping our merch store, you can listen to the news. <laughs> Do you know what they call that, Patrick? They call it multitasking. Oh, something I am not good at. But I'm sure all of our Tweedledees are excellent multitaskers. So here we go. Shop, drop, news. Patrick, your boy Tom Holland may have some competition in the Spider-Verse. Uh-oh. Deadline is reporting that Olivia Wilde has closed a deal to direct and develop a secret Marvel film project for Sony revolving around a female character in the universe. While not confirmed, it is expected that the story will be centered on Spider-Woman. In an August 19th exclusive, Deadline notes that the project, which will be written by Katie Silberman, who wrote Wilde's 2019 film Booksmart, has been a high priority since January. The Spider-Woman character has been the alter ego of several characters in the Spider-Man timeline, including Gwen Stacy, Mary Jane Watson, and Jessica Drew, who was the first to sport the costume in the late 1970s. Since the concept is being completely revamped by Wilde, it's unknown the direction the studio 
studio will go with Spider Woman. Wilde will join other directors like Nia DaCosta, who we recently reported will be directing Captain Marvel 2, Patty Jenkins, Kathy Yan, and the Eternals director Chloe Zhao in the growing number of female directors shaping the superhero genre. Spider-Woman marks the second film based around a female character in Sony's universe of Marvel characters to land a director after S.J. Clarkson was tapped to direct a Madam Web movie. Sony is also developing Black Cat and Silver Sable movies and is clearly making the effort to diversify the universe. Ooh, I love this story. I really like Olivia Wilde. I'm not familiar with a ton of her work. You know, we talked about Tron Legacy, which she was in, and I'm familiar with Booksmart and her directing capabilities. So this is a very exciting project for her and for fans alike. I frankly am wild about Wilde. That was a choice you made. And you know what? I applaud it. I stick to it. I stick to my choices, just like a web from Spider-Woman. You're really just leaning into those today. (laughs) I'm on fire. (laughs) As we approach 2021, much faster than I care for, the question on everyone's mind is how old is Patrick? Because he seems so youthful. But the other question is, what will Disney World be doing for their 50th anniversary? Adam, don't give me that face. Everyone was thinking it. Those are absolutely the only two questions on everyone's mind. Thank you so much. And we have some unofficial answers for you. Just just the almost facts here on Gaze Do the D, right, Adam? We're very noncommittal. We don't need <laughs> to be known as truth tellers. <laughs> we should be known as that, but we have not come into that legacy just yet. But here we go. Let's let's tell some almost truths. Like how youthful you are? Hey, I'm right here, Adam. Come on. I'm very aware. Okay. <laughs> Earlier this month, Disney filed permits for something called Project Nugget, which includes some infrastructure work that was put on hold earlier this year, which on its face value seems very unnoteworthy. However, in general, Disney does not use code names unless it's for something bigger and a little more secretive. So Disney bloggers believe that Project Nugget is a catch-all code name for anything related to the 50th or golden anniversary for Walt Disney World. I get it. What a clever name. We should start calling you Project Nugget. <laughs> because of all of my trips to McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on a Project Nugget right now. <laughs> that wasn't where I was going with it, but now, yeah, let's let's embrace that. <laughs> so while we don't know exactly what is in the works for the anniversary, we do have some pretty solid guesses around a few things we should expect. First, we can assume that rather than starting the celebration in early 2021, Disney will likely push the official start closer to the actual 50th anniversary, which is on October 1st. The party would then go on through the end of the year and likely deep into 2022. So strange to think about 2022 right now. It seems like the faraway future, but it's not. It's coming up a lot faster than we think it is. It's wild. It's Olivia wild. I was waiting for that. Yep, there it was. So it's also likely that projects used to promote the anniversary will be attractions and events that were already in the works prior to the shutdown earlier this year. For example, the Guardians of the Galaxy ride in Epcot. However, this attraction will depend on how quickly the actors will be able to safely be back together to film scenes for the ride. A few other projects for Epcot will likely be used in promotions like the nearly finished Ratatouille ride, the Play Pavilion, and Harmonious, the new nighttime show, all of which are expected to be ready to go prior to October 2021. A few other projects will likely be used as part of the year-long celebration rollout, but will open after the official anniversary date. Some examples would be the new Tron coaster in the Magic Kingdom, a new nighttime show for Animal Kingdom, and the highly anticipated Star Wars Hotel, Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. Of course, as we all know by now, all of this is very dependent on where we are with COVID-19 in regards to safety and people's willingness to travel by then. So we'll be sure to keep you updated as more information becomes available. This has got to be such a letdown for all of the things they originally had planned or were planning to plan (laughs) for the 50th, right? Like they were probably well into making arrangements and figuring out logistics. And I'm sure a lot of it just had to be scrapped. Absolutely. There's a lot of Imagineers that are very sad right now and super disappointed. 
But on the bright side, if there's one thing that Disney is wonderful at, it's pivoting, right? It's pivoting in times of turmoil and making adjustments and arrangements. So I'm hopeful that what they come up with will will still be very special. Frankly, right now, anything would be special to me. Maybe it'll just be like Mickey running down Main Street screaming, we're 50! (laughs) And throwing chicken nuggets at us. You just cracked it. Yes, that is why it is in fact called... Project Nugget. I cracked that nugget. hey Disney Plus may soon feature an adults-only section. That made me feel some things, Adam. I feel like I need to read this in a sensual voice, Patrick. I really wish you wouldn't. <laughs> Last week, <laughs> several sources claimed that Disney's streaming platform was developing a section with parental controls to house content from Disney-owned 20th Century Studios and Touchstone Pictures. YouTube film critic and host of Beyond the Trailer, Grace Randolph and Bill Hunt, editor-in-chief of The Digital Bits, both took to Twitter to report that they had heard the adult section would require pin code access. Hunt went on to state that the section would also include more 4K content. The site What's on Disney Plus noted that Disney recently sent out surveys regarding adult themed shows. So it's very possible, Patrick, that adults may soon get to experience DP after hours. Oh my goodness. Disney backroom. Remember when video stores had that curtained off area? (laughs) I sure do. I sure do. And once in a while, someone would just part the curtains ever so briefly and you could see horrible, horrible things. How do you feel about this, Patrick? An adults only section. It sounds weird. On Disney Plus. I actually think it's a great idea because now they can get more content that they were maybe afraid to put on there because it was lewd or lascivious and and children probably shouldn't watch it. So this seems like a smart, a smart path forward. I agree. It's all about getting people to purchase Disney Plus, right? So the more content they add, the more appeal they're going to have to adults who may think that Disney Plus is only children's programming. So yeah, I say go for it, Disney Plus. Get Golden Girls on Disney Plus, please. (laughs) Now, would that fall under adult content? Sadly, yes. Can you believe that? It would. (laughs) That Blanche, she was a she was a sexual monster. Women over 50 are not allowed to have sexual (laughs) relations. So that means you're getting close to that cutoff period, Adam. Oh, honey, with this back, (laughs) I have one position left. (laughs) I I hesitate to ask you, but I think we can't answer that without our own back room. (laughs) The Disney golf courses have recently added some new safety precautions for their guests in a new program called Park and Play, which means something very different to me. (laughs) Does yours involve an app? (laughs) Yes, it does. Yes, it does. (laughs) Or Craigslist. I don't want to discriminate. (laughs) Well, they took that away a long time ago, Adam. Come on. (laughs) That was a true loss to our community, that M4M section. (laughs) R.I.P. Craigslist personals. But (laughs) for all you golfers out there, you can now book your tee time with Disney and prepay with a credit card and then simply show up at the golf course and head straight to your golf cart, which has already been sanitized and prepped prior to your arrival, which will remove any need to go into the clubhouse for check-in. Contactless payment is now the only way to pay for your round of golf as cash is no longer accepted at the courses. Face coverings are also required in the clubhouse if you choose to use it. On the course, bunker rakes, sand bottles, and ball washers have been eliminated for your safety. So Adam, you will need to wash your own balls. Every day, sometimes twice a day. (laughs) Golfers are also advised along the course that flags should remain in the hole during putting. Wow, I didn't know golf was so arousing. (laughs) I know. This was this is the only reason I wanted to talk about this story, because it was tantalizing, tantalizing news. Balls, holes. Bunker rakes. I mean, come on. Sanitization. (laughs) So to utilize this new park and play situation, head on over to golfwdw.com and don't forget to wash your own balls. Please do that. Please. (laughs) It's so important and will make your gameplay much more enjoyable. You know what I'm saying? And if you're golfing with a friend, offer to wash their balls as well. (laughs) 
<laughs> I couldn't not say it. <laughs> What's up, Adam? This year. This year, Patrick. I mean, you just said a lot in that one sentence. (laughs) It has us all feeling a bit down. It has us all feeling isolated, and rightly so. We're taking great measures to do everything that we can to ensure that we can emerge from this pandemic smarter and healthy and ready to continue our lives. But in the meantime, we've kind of had this gray cloud hanging over us, this knowing that things just aren't right. Yeah, things are off. Things are off right now, Adam. Off the chain, off the rocker, off the charts, off of everything. Absolutely. And because of that, we thought it would be a great idea to feature a segment that would explore some of the inspirational songs from Disney that we truly love, because now is the time when we need to be listening to these songs and allowing them to give us a bit of a lift, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's safe to say that we were both inspired by our interview last week with Don Hahn, who directed Howard. And so much of Howard Ashman's music was very, very inspirational music and smart music and music that that lifted you up and made you want to move forward. And we wanted to explore the world of Disney inspirational music. And there's no better way for us to do that than to list our five most inspirational Disney songs. That's right. Our feature segment this week is a Fab Five list. I love the Fab Five list. It's been a while since we've done one, I feel like. It has been a while, and this is a great opportunity for us to list our songs and share them with our Tweedles, the ones that we really hold in our hearts, right? That's absolutely right. And we haven't done a musical Fab Five in a very long time. A very, very long time. In fact, it was episode 18 Patrick, when we last had a Fab Five list that related to music, it was our Fab Five songs from Disney animated films. It was so much fun to go back and explore what we said back then, because many of my tastes have shifted a little bit. In fact, Patrick, at the end of the episode, you said, and I quote, I bet if we did this a month from now, we would probably have different songs, depending on where we are in our life, because these songs have such a connection to our own personal stories. I mean... When you're wise, you're wise. And I was wise beyond my years back then. What happened? COVID-19 happened, Adam. (laughs) COVID-19 did happen. You know, when I went back and listened to that episode, too, I was like, wow, we sound really hopeful. (laughs) We had a spring in our step and a song in our heart. And now we are sitting in a dumpster fire. Wearing masks. Yes. Wearing, Wearing masks. Absolutely. But let's climb out of that dumpster for just a bit, Adam. And dive into our Fab Five inspirational songs. Let's do just that. Patrick, do you want to kick us off with your number five inspirational Disney song? Well, I guess I have to since you gave it to me and I can't really dispute that. So I'm going to, yes and, Adam, here is my number five inspirational Disney song. I am going with When Will My Life Begin from 2010's Tangled. Is there a better title for a song that kind of defines 2020? I mean, this is absolutely the anthem of 2020, for sure. Absolutely. So, When Will My Life Begin was sung by I'm Missing Her Like Candy, Mandy Moore. And it was written by Alan Menken and Glenn Slater, who, incidentally, also wrote the lyrics for the new songs in A Little Mermaid on Broadway and Sister Act on Broadway and School of Rock on Broadway. We saw Sister Act together, Patrick. We sure did. And I know that you really liked the music in that because when you are enjoying a musical, you cannot sit still and it's hilarious. I probably have talked about this on the podcast before, but when I hear like a harmony that's just so good, I have to physically like adjust. Yes, it's true. And your neck starts moving back and forth. It's amazing. I'm so sassy when I hear something I like. (laughs) You're very, very sassy. So I love this song because it's kind of a non-traditional I want song. It's not necessarily a slow, sweeping ballad. It's more of a a 60s folk song. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, guitar. You don't hear a lot of like driving guitar in Disney songs, but this definitely has it. Exactly. And it has that little bit of a pop flair, probably because Mandy Moore is singing it. Yeah, I remember the first time I heard it, I was like... 
inspired. I was inspired by it, but I was also like, this is not what I'm used to at the beginning of a Disney movie. Right, right. But it totally makes sense because it's sort of a mirror up to Rapunzel's circumstance at the time. She's hopeful, but she's also very stir crazy in a super confined space, which I think we can all relate to right now. I'm sitting in a closet, bitch. (laughs) Yes, yes, you are. That is your choice. But yes, yes, you are. (laughs) So the very first lyrics especially sort of emulates this. Uh, I'll just read them a little bit. So 7 a.m., the usual morning lineup. Start on the chores and sweep till the floors all clean. Polish and wax, do laundry and mop and shine up. Sweep again. And by then, it's like 7.15. That's every day for me. It was very thoughtful for Mother Gothel to keep Rapunzel in cocaine in the tower. (laughs) Yes, yes, she absolutely needed it. And those rhymes, though, are so delightful. I really like the lyrics to this song. Oh, it's a great song overall. My only complaint would be that it's too short. It is very short. But Mandy Moore, boy, oh boy, she is a sweet, sweet baby angel. And it's, I guess... It was tough for me to put it on the list because it's a little bit depressing to think about, but I think it's it's Rapunzel's driving positivity that really inspires me. Yeah, that and the melody itself is so uplifting. You know, I mean, she's talking about things that she does on the daily to kind of fill the time living in this tower, but it's still an upbeat song. Absolutely. And it's just a really beautiful song in general. So that is why it is my number five inspirational song. That is an excellent choice. My number five inspirational song is The Climb from the Hannah Montana movie. What? (laughs) Yes. Have you heard it? I've never seen anything Hannah Montana related, so I have not heard it. I have not seen Hannah Montana the movie, which came out in 2009 either, Patrick. I have not seen the movie, but I remember hearing the song for the first time and being like, this song has it all. I am inspired. Fair enough. Fair enough. Tell us all about it. Well, it was performed by Miley Cyrus. Indeed. Indeed it was. And it was written by Jesse Alexander and John Mabe. It is a country pop song. It's odd that both of our choices for number five are kind of more pop driven. And even When Will My Life Begin is a little bit country too, isn't it? A little more folky, but yeah. So the reason I love The Climb is because it talks about the journey, right? Like, it's not about the destination, which I think we can all kind of relate to the fact that a lot of times when we reach the destination, it's not exactly what we expected or it's not what we thought it would be. But then you look back on what it took you to get there and all the experiences you had along the way. And that's what made life so special. I like that. God, I'm a poet. (laughs) And you didn't know it. Actually, Jesse Alexander and John Maybard the poets. I just, I'm talking about a song that they wrote. And Patrick, I mentioned, I have not seen the movie, but I believe this song comes at a pivotal moment when Hannah Montana is mountain climbing and her wig falls off or something. I don't know. I'm just making that up because it's called the climb. I imagine you're exactly correct. I would assume so. Yeah. She's wearing cowboy boots and her wig gets caught on a tree branch. And that's when the song starts. That's right. The tree branch snatches off her wig and she's like, you know what? It's about the journey. That's right. But weirdly, she's wearing the exact same wig underneath that wig. It's a shocking reveal. Yes, it's very Monet exchange of her. I'm truly surprised you have not heard this song. Are you, though? It's so moving. It really is. And I'm not a big Miley Cyrus fan. I think she tends to be a person who's like, I'm wild and crazy. Like, just is constantly, like, pulling shenanigans. I don't know. But this song is it, and it is very special, and that's why it is my number five choice. Well, I will have to go and listen to it. I'm inspired to go and listen to it. That's how those Cyruses get into your heart. You know, her father, Billy Ray, with his achy, breaky heart, he got into your heart with that song. And Miley, she'll get into your heart with the climb, Patrick, I promise. And, of course, she is Dolly Parton's goddaughter, so she can do no wrong. Not related by blood, but spiritually related, and therefore she is the chosen one. Just like you and me, Adam. We're the chosen ones? Oh, I'm sorry, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) We're the chosen ones to stop what we're doing. I refuse to give the people what they want. Let's continue. Fair enough. Yes. Before we stop what we're doing, let's continue with our list and then we'll stop. Exactly. Okay, great. (laughs) So moving on to my number four inspirational song, I'm going with Proud of Your Boy from Aladdin on Broadway. Broadway. 
The Great Broadway, which premiered on Broadway in 2011. But fun fact, this song was actually written in the 1990s because it was intended to be in the animated movie Aladdin. That's right. Aladdin was going to have a mommy. It's true. So the song is sung by the beautiful Adam Jacobs, and it's written by Alan Menken and Howard Ashman. So as I said, it was originally written for the animated movie. It was actually one of the very first songs that was written for Aladdin, and it was supposed to come right after the song One Jump. So when the movie was first being conceived, Aladdin's mother played a big part in the movie, and this song was supposed to be a moment between she and Aladdin. But once she was removed from the film, they couldn't figure out how to keep the song into it, so it was removed. But when Aladdin was being workshopped for Broadway, Alan Menken knew that this was a very important song to Howard Ashman, so he made it a priority to add it back into the show. And it's just, it's really a beautiful and and haunting moment in the show. So in the Broadway version, you still don't have Aladdin's mom because it's insinuated that she has passed away. And so he's sort of singing this song into the ether to his mother. And it's it's very... I find relatable in that so much of what we do, or I guess for me anyways, is rooted into something that would my parents be proud of this? Like, do I get excited when thinking about telling them about something? And if not, is it is it even worth doing? And of course, Adam Jacobs singing it is is just the icing on the cake for this song. I'm I'm very proud of that boy. You have been waiting to call him your boy. I mean, he's got, when he turns around, his his Cave of Wonders is beautiful. <laughs> okay. You know, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? I know what you mean. Yes. You know, I have not actually heard this entire song. Oh, I thought that you saw the, the show. I have not seen Aladdin. No, not the Broadway show. I really, I actually really love Aladdin on Broadway. And this song is, is for me, one of the better songs in, in the musical. It's so interesting to go back and look at what was cut from films. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating to kind of dive into the process of it, because as we know, with Alan Menken and Howard Ashman, amazing songs were cut, like Proud of Your Boy, the, you know, that, that you really love. But these songs just didn't make the cut or didn't feel right for the film. And so they were kind of tossed aside. So it's great to know that it was kind of given this second life for Aladdin on Broadway. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I think you actually have heard this song because Adam Jacobs was in the Broadway Princess Party that we saw here in Minneapolis, and he sang that song. Did he really that night? He did, yeah. I'd had a lot of cocktails. You were very drunk at the time, so that, that makes sense. I was very drunk, and his pants were so tight that night. <laughs> yes, they were. Yes, they were. Although I believe any pants he would wear would be tight. Yeah, he's a, he's a tree of a man. Well, I'm going to have to go back and give it another whirl, Patrick. You should. I encourage you to do so. Proud of your boy from Aladdin. My number four choice for Fab Five inspirational songs from Disney is an attraction-based song. Ooh, intriguing. And it is Golden Dream, which is featured in the American Adventure in Epcot's World Showcase. Fascinating choice, but I highly, highly endorse it. It is a song that is forever tied to that attraction. In fact, it was there opening day on October 1st, 1982. It also appears in Disneyland's Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. It is currently performed by Tim Davis and Sophia Pizzullo. It was last updated in 2018 with new vocals and really beautiful orchestrations. It was written by Robert Moline and Randy Bright. And about halfway through the song, you hear audio excerpts from John F. Kennedy's inauguration speech and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and the 1969 Apollo 11 moon landing. So, Patrick, this song is basically American propaganda and pure cheese, and I absolutely love it. Have you heard this song? I have heard this song many, many times, but I have actually never seen that show. I cannot help but get a little teary, especially when I'm watching the attraction, and this song starts at the end of the attraction, and, and the whole theater kind of transforms. In fact, there's curtains all along the side of the theater that raise, and you see these beautiful statues representing different kind of 
national mantras or ideals. And it's a really beautiful moment. But the song itself is incredibly beautiful. And I think particularly now it's very meaningful in a time, you know, where we're really reckoning with our nation's dark history and at a time where we're dealing with COVID-19 and racial injustice and really kind of coming to terms with all of these different things, there's still this idea and kind of hope that we can overcome all of this and come out a better nation. And I think that this song really kind of encapsulates that idea, that hope that we are forever growing and changing and will come out on the other side of this a better country. Will you be playing this song as you're filling out your mail-in ballot to vote this year, Adam? I am only ever playing this song, Patrick. Every action I take is one of pure patriotism. And so I may be tying my shoes and this song is in the background. That's fair. That's fair. I knew that about you and it, it rings true. Like I said before, a lot of people can find this really cheesy. I find it really cheesy at times, too, but it is so moving to me. So if you have not heard Golden Dream from The American Adventure at Epcot and from Disneyland's Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, I suggest you check it out, please. And since we're having this very patriotic moment, Patrick, we might as well just remind people to please make sure you're registered to vote. If you can, please secure your mail-in ballot or absentee ballot now. Please do research to find out where you might be able to drop off your ballot should mailing it not be an option. There are boxes where you can drop them off, lock boxes that get your ballot directly to who they need to go to. What else, Patrick? Visit your Supervisor of Elections website to learn all you need to know. Or, you know what, Adam? Reach out to us if you have questions, because we are happy to help you. Yes, we will do that research for you to make sure that your vote counts. Quite a few Tweedledees actually have dropped into my DMs asking questions specifically about Florida, and I was so grateful they did. I directed them to exactly where they needed to go, and it was lovely. And while you're doing all of that, listen to The Golden Dream. (laughs) Yes, please. All right, Patrick, what is your number three Fab Five inspirational Disney song? Thank you so much for asking. I am going with the song Santa Fe from Newsies, which was originally written for the 1992 live action movie, but it was rewritten and reworked for the Broadway musical Newsies, which debuted on Broadway in 2012. And there are actually two versions of this song in the Broadway show, and I am specifically talking about the prologue version of Santa Fe. Not Santa Fe from Rent. (laughs) Although I do like that song, too. Who performs Santa Fe in the musical, Patrick? Thank you so much for asking, Adam. It was sung by my double hall pass, Jeremy Jordan and Andrew Keenan Bolger. Oh, double hall pass because both of them are options? Oh, at the same time, they're options. Let's be very clear about that. And the version from the movie is sung by Christian Bale, which is which is fine. It's good, but the Broadway version is is much better. It was written by Alan Menken with lyrics by Jack Feldman. And this this is one of the few examples, although I did already give one, (laughs) of a character's I Want song sung by a male character in a Disney movie. Guys can sing too. Guys have wants as well. I have many wants with Jeremy Jordan and Andrew Keenan Bolger. But (laughs) moving on, it is one of Disney's tried and true dreams, I guess, of of getting out of your current situation and and finally feeling free. It's just one of Disney's biggest messages that they, they tend to put in their movies. And I really, really love the line from it that is, keep your small life in a big city, give me a big life in a small town, which is, of course, a play on the big fish in a small pond saying. And when those two boys sing together, their harmonies are are so, so tight, Adam. It just, it gives me shivers when I hear it. Jack and Crutchy. <laughs> Do you know those songs that just make you almost cry because it sounds so beautiful. This is one of those songs for me. This Just the sound and the pitch behind it is it's so good. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I think this is a gorgeous song, and I was very moved by it. I have not seen the show live, but I happened to catch the filmed version of Newsies in the theater, and it was excellent. Yes, you can watch it on Disney Plus if you are so inclined to do so. It's a really wonderful Broadway show, actually. The dancing is stupendous. King of New York, get out of here. Everyone, everyone on that show can get out of here or get out of there and come here, I guess, because they are beautiful. 
This is so great, Patrick, because it's reminding me of all of the really moving music that Disney has written, the inspirational music and stuff that I haven't listened to in a long time. Like the last time I listened to Santa Fe was watching that filmed version of the Broadway musical in the theater. Yeah, there's so many inspirational songs in Disney canon, and they all have such different uh, melodies and styles and and messages. I, I was super excited to do this segment, and I can't wait to hear what you have to show for us next. Well, you're not going to have to wait much longer, Patrick, because my number three choice is out there from 1996's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I had a feeling this would make your list. It is performed by Tom Hulse with Tony J supporting because there is a very dark opening to out there called Stay In Here, which is actually its own song in the Broadway show, or so I've read. The music is by Alan Menken and the lyrics are by Stephen Schwartz. And this song is phenomenal. At first, you know, Patrick, when I was listening to it, as I was listening to just a ton of Disney music over the past week, when I heard this opening section with Tony J, I was like, I don't know, does this kind of bring the song down? And yes, it is really dark, but in juxtaposition, it actually helps make out there a brighter, more inspiring song because you're kind of taken down to this very dark place. And then, you know, Tom Hulse just lets it rip and you feel so inspired and energized. It's fabulous. And one of the reasons it's so fabulous, and this is something we haven't really talked about yet, are the orchestrations. And this song has the most sweeping, beautiful orchestrations by Michael Starbin. I think that's how you pronounce it, Michael Starbin. And as great as lyricists and composers are, because they are really providing the foundation of the song, they are the creators of the song, but the orchestrator is the one who adds in all the beautiful elements, the various instruments that really sell the song and make it such a special magical moment. And so for me, Out There's orchestrations are some of the most beautiful that Disney has ever created. Yeah, the whole movie, in fact, not just that song for me is absolutely its own masterpiece musically. And as we talked about in last week's episode with Don Hahn, I'm very excited to see where they're going to go with the live action film of Hunchback. I just can't wait to see this number live on the big screen. They're actually removing most of the instruments, and it's really simplified down to a kazoo and some clapping, some hand clapping. Wow, that is unexpected. And it may take an adjustment from me to accept that, but I'm sure I'll get there. Yes, here's a sampling. Out there. How was that? That is not what... I was hoping for. <laughs> God help the outcasts. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. It almost sounds like a tap number. Is Esmeralda doing a God help the outcasts tap number? There's a little soft shoe involved. That's for sure. Well, that's perfect because she has Jolly the Goat with her. So put those hooves to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that is my number three choice. Patrick, please tell us your number two choice. I shall, Adam. I shall. I am going with, for my number two selection, Shadowland from The Lion King on Broadway, which premiered on Broadway in 1997. But we must note, Adam, that earlier that year, it actually premiered right here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, before moving to Broadway. We know people who were involved with that show. We certainly do. Don't treat us any differently, but we certainly do. We were not among them, but... No. <laughs> Just by proximity, that makes us incredibly creative and successful. We are one degree away from The Lion King. That's right. So <laughs> this song, Shadowland, was originally sung by Heather Headley as Nala with a lot of backup vocals from the entire chorus, but specifically the woman who played Rafiki, Tzidi Leloka, who is extraordinary on the soundtrack and it was written by Lebo M, Hans Zimmer and Mark Mancina. Yes it was. Indeed. So again this is sort of a a non-traditional inspirational I want song in that it's really more of a journey song kind of what you were talking about earlier with Hannah Montana, I guess if you want to compare Shadowland to Hannah Montana. I do. I absolutely do. <laughs> but I I absolutely love 
where it's placed in the musical because here we have this strong woman who isn't singing about what she wants. She's just going out and doing what she needs to do because the men in her life have let her down. So she, I guess she womans up Adam and she takes matters into her own hands or into her own paws, I guess. That's right. It starts in such a dark place, this song. Like Nala feels very lost in this moment. Yes, but she's also realizing that if something's going to be done, it has to be her. So she finds herself immediately and, and, and finds the courage to, to save the pride, basically. Beyond the story of The Lion King, this is just an amazing and haunting song. Lebo M actually included a version of it in his Lion King concept album, Rhythm of the Pride Lands, in 1995. But then he, of course, adapted it and altered it for the Broadway musical. But the lyrics are based on his actual life experiences having been exiled from South Africa during apartheid, which just adds this this really beautiful and, and textured layer to the piece. And for my money, in The Lion King, this is the standout song. Yeah, if you don't know about Le Boheme, I would encourage you to research him because... I was not aware of how much he actually contributed to the Lion King soundtrack, not only the animated film, but also then the Broadway show and beyond. Like, as you said, there was this follow up album with him and Hans Zimmer kind of packaging all of the extra music they had created in the making of the animated film. So he is prolific and wildly talented. True story. Yeah, this is a beautiful song, Patrick. It is so, so moving. And when it's sung by Heather Headley, I mean, come on. Her voice is absolutely incredible. It really makes the song. Pretty much any woman who sings this song is one of the best singers on Broadway, usually. That explains why I've never been asked to sing this song. It does. It does indeed. Well, that was an excellent choice. My number two choice for Fab Five inspirational Disney songs is Part of Your World from 1989's The Little Mermaid. Delightful. And I believe this is the only song that actually crosses over with my Fab Five songs from Disney animated films back in episode 18. Oh, lovely. As I mentioned in that episode, and as we mentioned in last week's episode, it was performed by the fabulous Jody Benson with music by Alan Menken and lyrics by Howard Ashman. The orchestrations, again, got to give it up for the orchestrations by Harvey R. Cohen and Thomas Passatieri with assistance by Philip Giffen, who is uncredited, and Pete Anthony, who is also uncredited. And this, Patrick, is an I Want song, right? Oh, for sure. It is like the quintessential I Want song. It is so beautiful. It is so moving. And credit where credit is due to Jody Benson, who gives it this really quiet intensity. You know, if you've watched Howard or if you've gone on YouTube, there are extensive clips, even beyond what's in Howard, of Howard Ashman working with Jody Benson. And you can just see him talking her through the song and you see her kind of melt a little bit from her Broadway persona, which is kind of a belter and really getting that song out there. And you see her process what it's going to take to deliver the song the way Howard wanted it, which is, again, this quiet intensity and really kind of hushed excitement and hope. And, Patrick, if I may also tag on the reprise, which I think is actually even more intense and kind of a stronger message than the actual song part of your world, the reprise is just on another level. It is so beautiful. And with the animation in the film, again, it is just a stunning moment. It makes me want to sing along with Jody. I could never actually match what she's doing, but like just her want and her desire is so strong in that moment. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's a Disney classic for sure. So if you've watched Waking Sleeping Beauty and if you've watched Howard, you know that this song was almost cut from the film. Jeffrey Katzenberg did not want the song in the film. He thought that it kind of killed the momentum of the movie. And just imagine if we didn't have this gem of a song in the film. And it really did help shape Disney animated musicals going forward because it convinced the studio that this was such an important part of these musicals to have the audience hear what our heroine or hero wanted and to help kind of drive that need from them. I was really surprised to learn, Patrick, that this song actually didn't receive any nominations. It was not nominated for any awards. And it was, in fact, Kiss the Girl, which was nominated, and then Under the Sea, which won the Academy Award, the Golden Globe, and the Grammy for that year. Yeah, I almost wonder 
if they were afraid to submit this song because it was so new, it was such a, a different way of um, adding a song into an animated movie that they were afraid that people wouldn't understand it. And I wonder if that's why they didn't submit it for best song. It kind of speaks to how people viewed animation at that time, I think, where they wanted to recognize the more lively kind of traditional songs that you would find in an animated film. And of the three, this one clearly stands out as the one that like should have been the nominee and winner. It is so powerful. Yeah, The Little Mermaid in general sort of changed the game for how people think of Disney animated musicals. They shifted from these just sort of random songs that were sprinkled throughout a movie into an actual sort of Broadway setup where the songs are actually moving the story forward. Absolutely. So that is my number two choice, Part of Your World from The Little Mermaid. And Patrick, that takes us to your number one choice for Fab Five inspirational Disney songs. We've made it to the end, Adam. Here we are. My number one choice is Show Yourself from 2019's Frozen 2, sung by Edina Menzel and Evan Rachel Wood, and written, of course, by the delightful team, Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez. What a choice, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you so much. So again, this song is an interesting song for a musical in general. To me, it doesn't really fit into any of the traditional themes that you think of with a musical and songs moving a story forward. We've already had the I Want song. We've already had the love ballad. We've already had the comedy song. And of course, a big group opening number, which I'm assuming, I feel like this is why there was such drama around writing the song and getting it into the movie because they didn't quite know the message behind it until until they all sort of stumbled upon it. Finally, if you watch... Into the Unknown, the making of Frozen 2, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It was a journey to get the song into the movie. For me, I guess, if anything, if you were going to put this into a category, this is more of a discovery song because Elsa has already made the decision to go on the journey and now she finally gets this release of discovery into realizing who she is as a person and as a character in the movie. I just realized how a lot of these songs, including Show Yourself, kind of come at a moment when the characters, almost at their lowest... And they're using these songs to kind of drive themselves forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, this song has already made its way into LGBTQ culture as sort of a theme song for discovering and and living your authentic life. I have to say, when I saw this movie for the first time with you, I absolutely just burst into tears the first time I heard the lyrics. I have always been so different. Normal rules did not apply. Is this the day? Are you the way? I finally find out why. And that, that message is so beautiful and needed in our community right now. It's, it's, it's a really amazing song. So beautiful. You did cause a scene, though. One of the ushers came over and was like, does he need help? <laughs> and I did. I needed a lot of help. I needed a lot. And of course, when Elsa's mother sings that lyric, you are the one you've been waiting for, is such a beautiful, beautiful, not only musically beautiful moment in the song, but just such a wonderful message. And I have to parallel it to, I don't know if you remember this, but Obama made a speech a while back. And in it, he said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. And it is so interesting to see that mirror of this message in Frozen 2. They just referenced that speech on last week's episode of Pod Save America. Oh, they did? Yeah. And I thought of that exact same thing. I was like, oh, that sounds like Show Yourself. Oh, funny. Funny. Yeah, that was such uh, an amazing moment in that speech. It really spoke to me. And I feel like maybe that's why that lyric specifically spoke to me in Show Yourself. Yeah, what a powerful message to know that you have everything inside of you that you need to make your way in this world, but sometimes you need to be reminded of that fact. And that it's sort of your responsibility to to take matters into your own hands. You can't wait for somebody else to do it for you. You can't have your I want song and then just sit down and wait for something to happen. You have to use the tools that are available to you to make your voice known. Is that what I've been doing wrong? <laughs> yes, you have been letting everyone else do it for you, Adam. <laughs> I thought I would just sing my I want song and then sit down and have a piece of cake and everything would be taken care of. But it's not the case. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You are the one you've been waiting for, Adam. 
I love this song. I actually have a hard time listening to it. You know, there's those songs where if you listen to it too much, it pulls you into yourself so much that it takes you a while to get back out into the real world. Like I really kind of dive into myself when I hear this song. It's incredibly beautiful, but it does make you think. It makes you reflect on your own actions and your own life. Absolutely. Yeah. The messaging alone, for sure. But it's also one of those, as I was referencing earlier with Santa Fe, where the music and and the vocals are paired together so beautifully that it just it, all the emotions bubble up and I just start crying when I hear it. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good, good song. And I'm so happy that they landed on it. As Patrick mentioned, it's in Into the Unknown, The Making of Frozen 2. So if you have not seen that, watch that and you'll see the struggle, the absolute journey that the writers went on to find a way to incorporate this song into the movie. It's sort of the way Howard Ashman did with a lot of his songs that he really believed in. He wasn't going to back down. He, he was the one he was waiting for. He's like, you know what? No one else is going to do this for me. I have to stand up for myself and make sure that this song is in the movie. And I'm so glad that they did that as well for Show Yourself. I'm going to listen to that song as soon as we're done recording. <laughs> and cry and eat cake. And squeeze into my child size Elsa outfit. Perfect. Perfection. Just a typical day in my life. All right. That was a fabulous choice, Patrick. That takes us to my number one Fab Five inspirational Disney song. And my number one song is Circle of Life from 1994's The Lion King. We both have a Lion King song. We do. I mean, that soundtrack. Come on. It's wonderful. It's so sweeping and beautiful and, and all the adjectives. Circle of Life was performed by Carmen Twilley. She is the female vocalist you hear in the song. And also, Patrick, Lebo M, who provides the opening Zulu vocals for the song. And again, powerful, powerful stuff. And his fingerprints are all over that soundtrack in the most wonderful ways. Absolutely. When I was researching this, Patrick, I didn't know what the opening vocals actually said in English. Do you know what they translate to? I do not. They're very literal. He's basically saying, here comes a lion, father. Oh, yes, it's a lion. Oh, well, there you go. It sounds much more beautiful <laughs> in Afrikaans. A beautiful, beautiful moment in the film. So Carmen Twilley was a backup singer for artists like Celine Dion and Whitney Houston. She also did vocal work, as we mentioned previously on the podcast, in The Nightmare Before Christmas. And she's also worked on several other animated projects. Circle of Life was composed by Elton John with lyrics by Tim Rice. And Patrick, when you want an opening number set in Africa, you turn to two Englishmen to take care of that, don't you? Of course you do. That's the first place you should go. Obviously, obviously. And it was arranged by Hans Zimmer, who is German. So again, that's who you go to. I'm kidding, of course. Hans Zimmer also composed the score and won an Oscar for Best Original Score for The Lion King. Circle of Life features a choir of African vocalists led by Lebo M. And the song was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Original Song, but lost to another Lion King song, Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Circle of Life was also nominated for a Song of the Year Grammy. And Patrick, there is a Vienna Concert Hall concert, and I believe it's honoring the music of Hans Zimmer. And it features Lebo M and an artist called Rethi sings, and I posted it to our Twitter account at GDTD Podcast. The first two minutes of these artists performing it, backed by a full orchestra and a full choir, when I die, Patrick, and go to heaven, if I don't hear this song, like in the first two minutes, I'm going to be so disappointed. I will make sure that happens because you are clearly dying far before I will. Thank you so much. I need to hear this music when I transition to wherever I go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What speaks to me so much about this song is not only how beautifully the lyrics convey the the fact that, you know, this is just a repeating process that we're all on this circle of life, that we're all connected, but also the incredible choral arrangement, which to me is always so powerful and just makes a song so inspiring. Whenever I hear artists backed up by a choir and the soul of these performers coming through this song, it's just such a powerful experience for me. 
there's a fun story behind this song. I don't know if you've heard it before, and I, I believe it's the circle of life. But when Tim Rice and Elton John were writing this, they were sort of up against the wall. They couldn't think of anything. And then Tim Rice leaves the room to go, I don't know, make a cup of coffee or something. And literally, he comes back five minutes later, and Elton John had written the circle of life. It happened very, very quickly. And when they were first pitched the idea of The Lion King, they were shown the first kind of sketches for the opening of the film. And, you know, it was just those artist renderings that are very quick draws, but animated just to kind of convey how the story is going to progress. And they played Hans Zimmer's orchestrations with Le Boheme's vocalizations over it. And Elton was just floored. Like he was like, I know exactly what we need to do. I know how this film needs to open. And Patrick, I believe this is the first instance where a song is used as a trailer, a complete trailer for a film. You know, I don't know if you remember, but the trailers for The Lion King were just the opening number, it was Circle of Life, and then it would cut to Black Screen and The Lion King, and that was how they were selling this film. It was just that powerful. Yeah, with that dramatic drum beat at the very end of it. Oh, I get chills thinking about it. <laughs> it's wonderful. You've seen the Broadway version of it, haven't you? Yes, I saw it with you. Oh, that's right. I've seen it many times. I, I will go back and just watch the opening number of the circle of life in the Lion King and, and not need to see any more of the Broadway show because it is so special and, and beautiful. It's, it's everything you need in your life. <laughs> it's one of those great celebratory songs. Like you just feel uplifted when you hear it. And that's why it is my number one inspirational song from Disney. Well done. Well done, Adam. Well, Patrick, as with any other list, I have to ask you, were there any runners up for you, were there other songs that you were considering adding to your list? Sixty-five thousand songs, Adam. I, I have to say, um, almost there was almost there on the list. I think that was <laughs> one of my. <laughs> I think that was on my original list, right, a long time ago of of my very favorite Disney songs. That was your number four choice for Fab Five songs from Disney animated films. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, but I think it got etched out because this time we included Broadway songs as well. Any sort of Disney canon songs, also Belle's reprise from Beauty and the Beast is so wonderful, but it's like 13 seconds long, so it's hard to fit it into a, a top five list. And then, of course, I Can Go the Distance from Hercules is a beautiful, wonderful song, but again, very short. I know this may kind of sound obvious, but these songs are so beautiful that you ultimately want more of them, right? Like you just want to keep listening to it and hearing more of it. Yeah. But in an animated film, time is limited. So these songs do tend to be quite short. In the Broadway shows, you know, they have a chance to expand on them a bit. But in the films, they can be quite short and leave you wanting more. Yeah, absolutely. What about you? Did you have any um, also rans? Again, so many. How Far I'll Go. Yeah. Happily Ever After, actually, was one that I was considering. That's on my uh, running mix. It's so lovely. But then I'm like, why am I crying and running at the same time? That doesn't, that doesn't go together. <laughs> this is a crying run. <laughs> exactly. I had Life's a Happy Song from The Muppets. Oh, okay. You Can Fly from Peter Pan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Strongest Suit from the Broadway musical Aida. That is a, a wonderful song. I had a couple of high school musical songs, I have to admit. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And another attraction song I was considering, There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow from Carousel of Progress. Is there, though? Is there, Adam? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> we will find out tomorrow. Can you imagine if there was another scene they added and it was 2020 and they were all wearing masks, all the animatronics, and even the dog animatronic had a mask on? They're just melting from radiation. What a bleak ending to that attraction. <laughs> It's true. It's true. No, it just goes to show you that there are so many, so many inspirational Disney songs, but that's what Disney does, right? It's almost the reason Disney exists is to inspire people and to keep people positive. And it's been definitely um, a saving grace for me in, in quarantine that Disney Plus exists because I, I can revisit all of these inspirational, lovely sort of escapism movies and, and feel a little bit better. Yeah, and feel that connection to something you love so dearly, right? Like, it's impossible to separate Disney music from the films they come from or the attractions they come from. They're just tied to those memories and those really special moments in our lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Well, we would love to hear from you. We want to know what songs from Disney truly inspire you. You can reach out to us on social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at GDTD Podcast. Or you can always leave us a voice memo or an email at info at gazedothed.com. And now, Patrick, on to our least inspirational Disney songs. <laughs> I'm surprised Hellfire didn't make your list of inspirational songs, Adam. That that feels like, for you, a very inspirational song. Hellfire is so on brand for me. <laughs> hey, Adam. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Chewbacca. Oh, his face is so large in the screen. You know, Chewbacca must have an excellent dental plan because those teeth are perfection. Pearly white teeth with just a hint of an overbite. He kind of looks like Penny, your dog. (laughs) (laughs) He is is just like Penny, yes. (laughs) And those Frank Sinatra blue eyes. Oh, swoon. (laughs) Well, Chewbacca's here, Adam, so you know what that means. I do know what that means. It means that we are about to have a (laughs) Wookiee. We're about to have a (laughs) Wookiee? We are about to have a Wookiee. Yep, a Wookiee. We're about to have a Wookiee. We're making (laughs) Wookiee. Ooh. Yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Wookiee Fest? I don't know. Okay, fair. Fair, fair enough. Well, some people may not know what the hell we're talking about. So would you explain it to them, please? I will. It's quick D time. And this week we're doing quick D imagine queering. And that's why Chewbacca's here because Patrick has a Chewbacca mug that is filled to the brim with attractions you can find in Walt Disney World or Disneyland. And what we do during quick D imagine queering is we draw one of the attractions from Chewbacca's head and we gay it up, we queer it up, we add some glitter, we make it an LGBTQ plus experience. Absolutely. We offend everyone in the gay community. Par for the course with this podcast. Yes, absolutely. All right, Adam, I am going to reach my hand deep inside of Chewbacca and pull out an attraction. (laughs) If I had a dollar for every time I've said that. Oh, Patrick, I just figured it out. It's not a fortune cookie. It's a fortune Wookiee. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. We can end quick D there. What do you think? (laughs) That's as funny as we're ever going to get on this podcast. (laughs) All right, Adam, we we have a task ahead of us. We are Imagine Queering Muppet Vision 3D. Oh, okay. I like this. I mean, immediately, we just add more Miss Piggy, right? Add more Miss Piggy. And what's the name of the gay Muppet that was on the very first episode of Muppets Now? I want to say Howard. Was it Howard? I don't remember. Let me look it up. <laughs> I'm Googling. <laughs> I can't recommend you do this. I'm Googling gay pig. <laughs> Muppets. <laughs> Muppets will save you. Muppets yeah. will save you. Not safe for work. <laughs> it is Howard. It is, in fact, Howard, the gay pig. <laughs> So we should clarify that Don Hahn's documentary, Howard, is not, in fact, about a gay pig. (laughs) It's not, but now I can't stop laughing at the fact that I just Googled (laughs) gay pig and was horrified at some of the results. (laughs) (laughs) Oh... So really, though, I mean, that really just made our case, if anything. People want to see gay pigs, so let's add them to the Muppets. More gay pigs in the Muppets, starting with Howard. I think think we're done here, Adam. (laughs) Talk about adults-only section on Disney+. Plus. I mean, talk about 3D, you know what I mean? It's more like, <laughs> more like 9D. <laughs> 9D at once, huh? <laughs> oh, I can't. <laughs> That will do it for this episode of Gays Do The D. Thanks for listening. To become a patron of the podcast, visit our website at gazedothed.com slash donate. For a donation of any amount, you can receive exclusive Gays Do The D content and help us continue to bring you the very best Disney news and discussion. Continue the conversation after this episode on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GDTD Podcast and submit your questions or show ideas to info at gazedothed.com. 
Have a great week, everybody. See you real soon.